Jesus calls us here to meet him as through word and song and prayer. We affirm God's promised presence where his people live and care. Praise the God who keeps his promise. Praise the Son who calls us friends. Praise the Spirit who among us to our hopes and fears attends. Jesus calls us to confess him word of life and Lord of flesh and frailness, saving all who fail or fall. To his holy human story, tell his tales that all may hear. Tell the world that Christ in glory came to earth to meet us here. calls us to each other vastly different though we are creed and color class and gender neither limit nor debar join the hand of friend and stranger join the hands of age and youth join the faith in their common search for truth. Jesus calls us to his table rooted firm in time and space where the church in earth and heaven finds a common saints and sinners hosted by our Lord and King.
However you are accessing the service today, it's brilliant to have a live congregation in front of me. You are very welcome. We're also offering a welcome to those who are accessing the service through the radio, 105.9 Bishop FM, or, or through YouTube, and that can be any time uh, throughout the week and beyond, or, or indeed through the Bishop Auckland Methodist Church website. There's a whole way, a whole number of ways in which the service is being received today, but it doesn't matter how you are receiving the service, you are equally welcome. We are marking Passion Sunday today, or the fifth Sunday in Lent, and uh, we've added to the display on the cross at the front of church here the crown of thorns. Uh, if, if you're looking at it visually in church, you can see the crown quite clearly. Um, you have to look quite carefully if, you, if you're looking at uh, a YouTube, but the crown of thorns is right at the very top of, of the cross today. A call to worship for our service. Some words of Jesus. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. If it dies, it bears much fruits. Our opening hymn is Let Us Build a House, but the chorus is, uh, you, you'll be able to hum along at least in church, sing along uh, remotely, uh, but the chorus is All Are Welcome. I hope you feel very welcome in this service. Words within the world. 
songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter. That is uh, such an appropriate hymn to begin our service as we begin to tentative, tentatively come back into churches for worshipping together, uh, sharing in worship. We're not quite sure how to, to, um, to, to title what, what we're trying to do now uh, as we try to renew, to rebuild, to replant, to repot, because we, we're into spring and we're into planting. Um, but we're trying to renew what is going on in, in our churches. We tentatively take the steps to, to meet together in worship once again. But whatever we're doing, we're doing it together. Let us build. Um, but then we're saying all are welcome and all are indeed so welcome. Our opening prayers of adoration and confession and then we share together in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. We come to you, eternal God, and offer you our praise. Unsurpassed in majesty, matchless in your holiness, you have shown to us in Jesus unconquerable love. As we contemplate his passion, may your spirit guide our prayers, that we may worship you sincerely and in truth for Jesus' sake. Amen. And a prayer of confession, comp confession. God of compassion, with whom is great power to redeem, we acknowledge with penitence what poor disciples too often we are and how slow we are to follow in his way. Jesus forgave his enemies, but we are vindictive and seek revenge. Jesus never used force to fulfil his purposes, but we want our own way, whatever the cost. Jesus was silent before his accusers, but we bluster and argue and squabble and fight. Jesus prayed fervently for strength to resist evil, but we expect painless results from feeble efforts. Forgive us, O God, we pray. In your abundant mercy, wash away our sins. Create in us clean hearts and put a new and right spirit within us. We ask your forgiveness and accept your forgiveness in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, reading from verse 31. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them, 
and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizens to know the Lord, because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Amen. And our service continues with the contribution of the reflection from Hope and Millie. Epistle is from Hebrews reading. Reading from Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 5. In the same way, Christ did not take upon himself the honor of being a high priest. Instead, God said to him, You are my son. 
Today I have become your father. He also said in another place, you will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Michaladek. In his life on earth, Jesus made his prayers and requests without loud cries and tears to God, who could save him from death. Because he was humble and devoted, God heard him. But even though he was God's son, he learned through his sufferings to be obedient. When he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. And God declared him to be high priest in the priestly order of Michalizdek. Amen. We're reminded of the Trinitarian nature of God in our next hymn, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Look out for for the Trinitarian nature at the beginning of each verse as we listen to Lead Us, Heavenly Father, Lead Us. Gospel reading to which we are led today comes from St. John's Gospel. Chapter 12 and reading from verses 20 to 33. Some Greeks were among those who had gone to Jerusalem to worship during the festival. They went to Philip, he was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, And the two of them went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has now come for the Son of Man to receive great glory. I am telling you the truth. A grain of wheat remains no more than a single grain, unless it is dropped into the ground and dies. If it does die, then it produces many grains. Whoever loves his own life will lose it, Whoever hates his own life in this world will keep it for life eternal. Whoever wants to serve me must follow me, so that my servant will be with me where I am, and my father will honour anyone who serves me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, do not let this hour come upon me? But this is why I came so that I might go through this hour of suffering. Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven, I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said, 
an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, It was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. In saying this, he indicated the kind of death that he was going to suffer. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The fifth Sunday in Lent is also marked in the Christian calendar as the first Sunday in Passion Tide. So we've got um, a, a double a double meaning for today. The crisis of the kingdom inaugurated by Jesus is on a collision course with the established rites and practices of his day. There is a sense of the shadow of the cross looming, engaging our thinking, and the traditional theme for Passion Sunday looks at the king, the kingdom, and the victory won by Jesus on the cross. Each of today's readings has something to offer to us as we move closer to the events of Holy Week the current state of affairs in the time of Jesus is about to be deeply changed and the world is to be changed forever. The words of Jeremiah that we heard today are a feature of the Methodist covenant service that is held either at the beginning of a new calendar year or at the beginning of a new Methodist year in September. Henry McKeating Uh, describes this new covenant as an aim to reprogram the will, an aim to reprogram the will. Now there's a concept to to grasp a hold of. Jeremiah says that the days are coming when God will make a new covenant. This statement is true on a number of levels. It is true for Jeremiah himself as he looks with hope at his presently ruined city of Jerusalem and his conquered nation. But it's also true for us as we enter the season of our Lord's Passion. And there's something new about the covenant as well as we begin to worship again in churches once more. The prophet's proclamation is that God and the people of God are joined together in a new covenant that is internalised rather than being dependent upon adherence to a strict set of written laws, the thou shalt nots. The relationship with God is transformed as a result because it's deeply set within each one of us. We know that as we move with Jesus through these next two weeks or so, we will be witnesses to the making of that new covenant. This is nothing other than a covenant sealed in the suffering, in the death, and in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The words, however, speak to us today on yet another level. We live in a critical time for society and the planet. There is something enormously important about the times we live in now. The events surrounding climate change global warming, Black Lives Matter movement, and the safety of women in modern society all indicate that much of the fabric of contemporary human society simply cannot continue in the direction it is currently taking. There are many things which must change if there is to be a human future. In that sense, a great deal of new covenanting needs to be undertaken, We must have the imagination to inspire and galvanise into action men and women throughout the world to show and exercise a greater resolve to work together for the good and for the wholeness of everybody. In no other generation to date has the world's population been so aware of its interconnectedness and interdependence. Links need to be made across political economic, social and spiritual divides to ensure the well-being of the world and its creatures. A new covenant is needed and it is needed now. 
The new covenant proclaimed by Jeremiah was one to be written on the hearts. Each person might know God as God knows them. The covenant is sealed by the mutual sense not of belonging to, because that's all about possession, but of belonging with, belonging together. The covenant of God. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Thus we seek to inaugurate a new age of the Holy Spirit in inspiring us to peace, to justice and to concern for the whole created order. Jeremiah was of course pro- prophesying to the people of Israel and from that people was expected to come their Messiah. We Christians recognise the fulfilment of those expectations in Jesus of Nazareth. As we know, though, Jesus did not conform very closely to the expectations of the people of the time, and he suffered much rejection as he travelled around the regions of Galilee and Judea. Nevertheless, there is evidence in the Gospels of Jesus going out beyond the boundaries of Judaism, and the Gospel reading for today gives us one such example. As it was the time of the Passover festival, there were plenty of foreigners thronging around Jerusalem. News about Jesus was spreading, and some Greeks sought him out. What we see in this episode is a model for how we might help people on their journeys of faith today. Somehow, the Greeks knew to approach Philip as one of the followers of Jesus. They had a simple but very profound request. Sir, note the uh, politeness, the respect there. Sir, and they're talking to Philip at this stage. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. They approached with humility, they approached with respect, and their example has been followed by countless people in succeeding generations. Philip went and told Andrew, writes St. John. It can be so easy to pass over these very few ordinary words. Philip went and told Andrew. It may seem that Philip took fright somewhat and thought such a request might be above his pay grade. But does it also suggest a shyness and timidity in Philip himself? You know, in those few words we find real humanity. And we know that we can be hard on ourselves too. Why am I so shy? Why do I find it so difficult to approach that person Is it something in me? Is it something in them? Why can't I deal with it? When we're in times of uncertainty, let us have confidence that we too can achieve the goal of bringing people to Jesus in our own unique and individual way. Well, Philip told Andrew. And by way of an aside, here is another interesting little side note. We know Andrew to be the brother of Simon Peter and one of the early fishermen disciples of Jesus, those two sets of brothers, Simon and Andrew, James and John. The other three went on to form that inner cycle of disciples with Jesus, but mentions of Andrew throughout the Gospels are actually quite few and far between. That could be today's homework, couldn't it? Just see how many times Andrew crops up. However, here he is, and here Andrew is pressed into action. He went with Philip to tell Jesus, and presumably make the introductions. And isn't that too our task today? To be available to those who might want to search out Jesus, and then to introduce them to Jesus, because we are his friends already. The response from Jesus is not so much one to the Greeks, but to all who would hear, both then and subsequently. Jesus declares that the time has now arrived for the Son of Man to be glorified. Commentators on the Bible suggest that the other Gospel writers see suffering and glory as two distinct things. St. John, however, sees the suffering of Jesus as his glorification, 
This is why he has come to this world, that the world might be saved through him, notwithstanding his suffering is absolutely real, it's absolutely degrading, it's absolutely humiliating, and it leads to that appalling and agonising human death. We know that Jesus frequently took examples from nature, and here is another one. The grain of wheat looks to all intents and purposes dead. It is only when it is sown in the ground that it can achieve its potential for new life. This is indeed a triumph of life over death. For as Jesus remarked, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus applies this concept to the lives of his followers too. Those who love their lives as they are will not have ultimate peace and satisfaction. By contrast, those who are prepared to make great, even ultimate sacrifices will gain everlasting life. Nevertheless, in the humanity of Jesus, doubts can still creep in. Jesus speaks of his troubled soul in verse 27. And this is effectively John's equivalent of the Gethsemane prayer of the other gospel writers. The response is the voice from heaven, speaking of glorification which Jesus can understand, which, but which others only hear as a sound. Humanity is reassured by divinity. The victory of the cross will be completed. The writer of the letter to the Hebrews reflects upon the glorious victory of Jesus and refers to the Old Testament priestly figure of Melchizedek. His was an eternal priesthood, and this is taken on by Jesus as God's only son. There follows that vivid word picture of the scene of Jesus praying alone in Gethsemane, communing with God, his heavenly father. The shadow of a ghastly human death looms larger with each passing hour. The image of, is one of a human experience of, of absolute terror. Jesus identifies totally with each and every one of us in our humanity. He, his, he is indeed flesh of our flesh. The depiction of this scene offers us several important lessons. Firstly, it teaches us the wonder and the terror of the incarnation, the act of becoming human and giving up the attributes of divinity, with all that means, seen in this moment of prayer. There are any number of moments in our life experience when we value our Lord alongside us in our moments of doubt and of terror ourselves. Secondly, it teaches that Jesus did not himself receive a neat and helpful response to even his most agonised prayer. We need to listen with care and with discernment to God's answers to our prayers. Thirdly, we can learn from the attitude and behaviour of Jesus. Of course, there is an enormous divide in time and culture from first century Jerusalem. But we see that Jesus does not shrink from expressing his fear, at least emotionally and possibly physically too. There is additional assurance for us in the assertion that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. We understand how in times of suffering, including suffering about which we can do little, even those of the strongest faith can question God and God's love and goodness and presence. Through Jesus and his example, however, we have assurance that God is always present with us, including in times of suffering. Victory over the cross made Jesus perfect and opened the way to eternal salvation for us all. Writing his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul asserted triumphantly, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. So let us, each and every one of us, 
be confident in God's love and care for us and take into the experience of our lives the confidence of the victory of Jesus over the cross. Death could not hold him prisoner and he lives forevermore. Amen. And we pause for a moment of reflection with Hannah's prayer for today. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This week, consider how God enables us to continue our walk with him, even when we tire. Think of a ribbon. When you hold it, it can look weak. Pray for areas in your life that need a fresh infilling of God's spirit to energise you, to help you feel connected to him again. A ribbon will flutter energetically in the wind. Give thanks to God for his power and strength. Think of wind blowing in your face. Remember that God sends his spirit to renew our strength. We reflect upon what Jesus has done for us in our next hymn, Man of Sorrow. have our time of prayer for others, our prayers of intercession. There's uh, the usual bidding and response, Lord, in your mercy, and the response is, hear our prayer. So let us pray for our own needs and the needs of the world. God of our salvation, we remember at this time how our Lord Jesus Christ faced suffering and death that the glory of your love might be revealed and draw all the world to you. And so we pray for those who are suffering at this time. We bring to you, compassionate God, those who are ill, perhaps dreading what the future may hold, or undergoing painful treatment, or frustrated by the limitations illness imposes. We pray for those still afflicted by coronavirus, especially those who are suffering from the lasting effects of, of this disease. We hold in our prayers those who are waiting for other procedures to take place, but 
these procedures have been delayed by the necessary focus upon treating those patients with coronavirus. It is a time of frustration and pain and suffering for each of them. We pray that you will be with them in their need at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you, compassionate God, those who are in need, those who are homeless, those who are hungry, those who are malnourished. We bring to you in prayer the lonely and the unloved. Those in other parts of the world that we can only access through watching our news bulletins. We express our horror at the living conditions that so many have to live in and especially those who find themselves in conflict zones. We pray for those children in this world who bear such heavy burdens at such young ages and who have to live with so little hope. Be near to them, we pray, in their suffering at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you, compassionate God, those who grieve, those who have lost loved ones for whatever reason in these last 12 months and who have not been able to properly mark their passing and mourn their loss because of the restrictions that have been so necessary. We pray for those who watch over the dying, those in our health and care services, those families who are giving to their loved ones sacrificially at this time. We pray for those who are recently bereaved and particularly remember the family of Sarah Everard. Be with them, we pray, in this time of such devastating loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you, compassionate God, those needing forgiveness, some eaten up by guilt, others burdened with empty lives or unable to love. We pray for those who feel unloved, those who have been abandoned by families and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we bring to you, compassionate God, our own suffering, our pain at falling short as your children, our pain at seeing the pain of others, our pain embraced in the name of love, God with us, in the darkness of suffering, may the glory of your love be revealed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, who by his sufferings has brought us to wholeness and to joy. Amen. It has been a joy for me to join with you in worship today. However you are accessing this worship, whether radio, website, YouTube, especially here in person, thank you for sharing today. Our closing hymn is Lift High the Cross.
now may the blessing of God, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and with all whom you love, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.